Hi there, I'm John Iverson and welcome to our panel of crack pundits as we look at a week in politics. Our slogan is, if it's news to Canada, it's news to us. So, as, as usual, I'm joined by Marcella Monroe, owner-operator of WPM Public Affairs and Andrew Balfour, managing partner of Rubicon Strategies. Uh, this week, Parliament and school are out and election fever is in the air. Uh, we're going to look at the parliamentary session just passed and look at the state of the main parties. We will talk about Erin O'Toole's one-man crusade to protect and save Canada Day. But first, let's talk about the breaking news. Uh, 751 bodies discovered in unmarked graves at the Marieville Indian Residential School site in Saskatchewan. Uh, tragic, but not a surprise after last month's discovery of 215 bodies in, uh, in Kamloops in British Columbia. We knew there were many children buried in communal sites in unmarked graves. It's still distressing, obviously, to hear about so many kids whose bodies have not even uh, got a headstone or been recognised. Um, and this is just one school. I mean, I think the estimates were that there were 3,200 uh, named and unnamed children who had died in these schools. And yet this is 751 in one school. We don't know that they were all children. We don't know that they were all students at the residential school. but but pretty shocking, um, you know, and, uh, and another reminder of the institutionalised neglect in the residential schools. I think, I think for most of us it's a good, a t good time to listen twice as much as, uh, as we talk, but I think we're, we're kind of obliged to look at the political implications of this. Uh, Marcella, I mean, Canadians are shaken by this story. Um, people want action. From a political point of view, it highlights the government's Indigenous agenda and its record on Indigenous issues. How do you think the government has done, the Trudeau government has done on this file? What more can be done on this particular issue, do you think? Yeah, I mean, I was... Obviously, it's a horrible story. I've spent the last couple hours on and off um, looking at some of what our Indigenous leaders are saying to us today. I think you're quite right. We need to be listening. Um, it was amazing to watch Chief Delorme I think he's um, approached this with such dignity and patience, uh, which, frankly, I'm a little bit running out of. I think the statement from the Prime Minister today, as I heard several of these Indigenous leaders tell us, and I agree with them wholeheartedly, is that, you know, it amounts to a statement that's basically thoughts and prayers. And today, I think most Canadians would like to see some concrete actions taken. There's a number of things they could probably just do today. They could drop their lawsuits. Um, they, in terms of the Jordan's law, they could, um, you know, uh, step up uh, work. I can't believe there's still communities without f clean dr drinking water. Like, how has that taken us so long to solve? Um, they should release whatever information the government is holding that they so far refuse to release. They should compel the Catholic Church, legally if necessary, in my view, to re release documents that they've refused to release. You know, it turns out in this one grave site that some Catholic priest that was running that school in the 60s decided it was okay just to remove the gravestones. Like, what possible rationale could there have been for that? So I think today is a day for concrete actions. I think, you know, today having the Crown Indigenous Minister um, send a, a, a vulgar racist text uh, to an Indigenous MP uh, and then thinking she can just apologize, that that minister needs to be relieved of her duties today of all days. We should tell people, if, if, they, have, if they aren't aware of it, that's Carolyn Bennett who sent a text to Jody Wilson-Raybould suggesting she was motivated by uh, a pension. pension. So anyway, I, I just think today they should be looking at some concrete actions they could take. It, it can't just be about us, you know, mourning with the Indigenous population, although I think lots of us will do that and should be. Andrew, do you think this uh, translates beyond the, the people who are watching politics closely? I mean, uh, a poll, an Angus Reid poll suggested that the majority of Canadians don't think Indigenous people should have special status um, and that it's time to move on from all of this. Do you think attitudes are shifting on the Indigenous file or is it still really of marginal concern to most people? Mm. First, I'd say, I mean, as we all know, there will be more announcements and findings of these 
mass graves. They're, you know, all of the provinces have now put money into looking into it. So it's inevitable that this will keep happening. And <clears throat> perhaps as this happens, it'll make it so that people are paying more attention to it. But I don't think that going into an election, and I don't think that in any election that I've witnessed that this is a thing that moves votes, uh, it probably should be more of top of mind for the average person, but I don't think particularly coming out of a pandemic that this is something that uh, will be you know, a big platform issue or a big election issue. Well, let's, let's link this. Sh it should be, frankly. <laughs> No, no, well, I, I, I just said. I mean, it, it's not, it hasn't been our responsibility that we, you know, we weren't around, obviously, to set this up, but it's surely it's our responsibility to try and live up to those treaties finally. Well, I think the, the, the reaction to the, to the first case, at least, uh, was, uh, it went deeper than almost anything I've seen on the Indigenous file uh, in 20 years. So, so here's hoping. Uh, Erno Tool uh, linked the Indigenous file and elections on Wednesday when he made a speech before the latest discovery, I should add, um, saying that the road to reconciliation does not involve tearing down Canada. And he said that the, uh, the discovery of the, the remains in Kamloops um, has been used by some people to attack the very idea of Canada. He, ca he had out a cancellation of Canada Day in some parts of the country and said it's time to build Canada up, not tear it down. Uh, Marcella, there was an, an, uh, another Angus Reid poll earlier this week that suggested two-thirds of Canadians do not believe Canada is a racist country. At the same time, they endorsed racial equality and diversity. Do you think it's possible to acknowledge the tragic mistakes that have been made in the past and still be proud of the country that Canada is now? Well, I think we can we can certainly do both, and I think it's incumbent upon us to do both. And I think that, you know this very poorly now timed speech um, and Well, let's, and let's, let's point out, though, that, that it was made 24 hours before the announcement today. Yeah, but I think we also need to link it to, you know, the framing of the speech. The reason he was sort of promoting this idea of somehow there's someone trying to, people are trying to cancel Canada um, is was a megaphone to his base. You know, he's tried to moderate some of the positions of the Conservative Party. And in my view, that, that nugget, that, that kind of thread he was trying to pull, was trying to kind of wink to his base and say, you know, we're still going we're st we're to be with you on some of these, uh, you know, more tough conservative ideas. Um, but, you know, Newfoundland, for example, has long had a kind of two-part Canada Day where they kind of take the morning to mourn uh, the soldiers that they lost in World War I, and then in the afternoon they celebrate the Canada we become. That's and I point. think there's no reason that this country um, can't do both and. I heard, again, these Indigenous leaders, and there were several of them, um, who weren't saying this is about cancelling Canada. They were, in fact, saying it's time for Canada to live up to who we say we are mm -hmm. um, and suggesting, you know, things you could do would be to encourage people to read the summary of the reconciliation report. Um, doesn't mean you can't also celebrate what Canada's tried to be and what, what Canada continues to grow to be. So I think, um, you know, we shouldn't be critical of cities like Victoria or Fredericton who are, who are dampening down their Canada Day celebrations. I think we just need to have a different approach. I think you make a good point about the two-part Canada Day. That's a, an excellent idea. I take issue with your point, though, that, that, uh, tr that O'Toole was trying to reach his, out to his base because I think, actually, he was trying to reach out to people beyond the base uh, that same Angus Reid poll suggested that uh, two-thirds of Liberal supporters also felt, uh, did not agree with the statement that Canada is a racist society. And I think there is a, a feeling among uh, many people who are not necessarily Conservatives that, uh, that the Trudeau government has knocked Canada too often and not stood up for it enough. Um, Andrew, do you think there's a big gender? There's a big gender difference, though, in that poll. There was right? a big gender so difference. I think if you're trying to talk to middle class women, you're not doing a good job by not addressing the racism. It was a. It was. I don't think that's Aaron O'Toole's voter. No, he's he's probably given well, it's up. It's not going to be. But but Andrew, um, you know, I think O'Toole's trying to make a contrast with Trudeau and with just uh, Jagmeet Singh. We talked uh, about Singh a couple of weeks ago, who had said uh, he believes Canada to be a racist country. 
from a political point of view, is that a, a, a winning strategy for, for O'Toole? <laughs> um, I don't know if there is at this point in time a winning strategy for Aaron O'Toole. Um, you know, if you look at recent polling, he's just, you know, falling like a rock at this point. Um, but yeah, no, he is trying to get that, the mushy middle. Everyone likes to get that mushy middle and he's trying to get it and it'll be primarily like an older white male voter that would be, find what he's saying appealing. Um, but I think it's also, I, I'm sure that him and his advisors regret having that speech based on the news that came out today. It was ill-timed in hindsight, no doubt. Yeah. Let, let's turn to the, the end of the parliamentary session and the prospects for an election. Um, I would say we are odds on to head into one in the fall. Does anybody disagree with that? <laughs> no, sir. <laughs> um, there is the matter of a trigger, though. I mean, how do you trigger an election? Um, I mean, you can do it because you can walk up to the, the governor yeah. general, assu assuming we have one. But he has to have a reason for doing so. What, Andrew, what do you think? Or, do, or does it matter? I, I don't think it really matters. I think that most Canadians, let's say that this is called in mid-August or end of August or whatever. People aren't going to be paying attention. They're going to be on holiday worrying about their kids getting back into school and all that stuff that people worry about. And you guys might write about what the reason is, but I don't know whether people will be reading things about it right then. Like, the simplest answer is, you know, we've just come out of a pandemic. We've now got everyone vaccinated and the economy is turning back on. It's a mandate on how we recover and what direction we go in. And I think that your average person, the and again, like the people who are part of the prime minister's electoral coalition, not conservatives, not committed voters in other ways, but the people that he needs to get a majority will understand that. And I think that they'll be like, okay, that's fine. Yeah, uh, we want to figure out a way to come out and how we recover. And this election's about the recovery. And if you can frame it like that, and we saw too that Aaron O'Toole is trying to make his thing about the government is corrupt and incompetent. And I think that if you're trying to do that, that you are playing with fire because if you actually make Canadians ask themselves whether that's true, they're going to look at it and be like, I'm vaccinated, I'm back at work, life is getting back to normal, and things seem to be just fine. So eh, I, I don't think that you can get too upset about him calling an election. And the people who keep saying that there might not be an election, like, if I looked at these polling numbers and I'd be like, can I have it today, please? Right now? Can everyone go to the polls tomorrow? That'd be wicked. <laughs> yeah, there, there was a narrowing in, uh, in about May as, as we, looked, we were looking south and they were enjoying their spring and, and we weren't. Um, and the polls narrowed to within a mar the margin of error. Uh, an Abacus, Abacus poll today had the Liberals 10 points ahead. And O'Toole Let, having fallen five points in the last month. When, when the Conservative Party starts getting towards mid-twenties, panic sets in. Yes. Marcello, what do you think on the Liberal strategy? Uh, well, I agree with everything Andrew said. Look, I think um, there was lots of punditry in British Columbia when John Horgan decided uh, to go to the polls, and the pundits spent the better part of a week saying this was foolish, um, saying it was wrong to do during a pandemic. The Liberals there tried to make a big deal out of it, and then it kind of blew away because to what Andrew was saying, that wasn't what voters were most concerned about, whether or not the, how the minority government uh, decided to call an election. So I think that that's um, you know, part of what the Trudeau government is well aware of. I don't think it will play in. Um, and I do think, you know, Aaron O'Toole, I'm looking at Aaron O'Toole's weaknesses seem to be much bigger. He, he probably will get a little bump as Canadians start to take a look around. Um, you know, I think Jagmeet Singh does have some opportunity. And, you know, I, I think issues like this where uh, around um, these in Indigenous burial sites, I mean, that's going to be a good contrast for him because he is proposing some more and quicker concrete action. So that might, you know, it will definitely appeal to the NDP base. It might make some of those voters that would have uh, migrated to the Liberals think twice about that. Um, but, yeah, I think the Liberals are well positioned to go into a fall election, and I, I really don't 
I, I can't fathom, unless we suddenly dove into some crazy variant fourth wave, I can't fathom how they would decide to not. And do you think they would come out with a majority? At this point, it, I feel like that's on the, on the table. Mm. You know, they're still going to have to work for it, I think. But yeah. And Andrew, you were nodding away there as well. What about uh, Jag Jagmeet Singh? The only concern at that point in time, and we've talked about this before, is if all of a sudden it looks like there's zero chance that Aaron O'Toole can win, then some of the swing voters that j the Prime Minister needs um, might go and hang out with the NDP or the Green, or well, probably not the Green because they're incompetent at this point, but um, like you know, they might be willing to go float around and that would be a problem getting to the majority. But um, I think that- And there is a danger that some of those liberal voters are too cocky and stay home, right? So that's, that's got to be- Well, turnout's oh, always a problem. We have like, seen yeah. hubristic leaders uh, slipping on a banana skin. We saw uh, David Peterson in Ontario, who was uh, miles ahead in the polls, suddenly lose to Bob Ray. So right. strange, stranger things have happened. But on, just quickly on the Jugmeet thing, I think that Jugmeet's big thing is that him trying to get these, you know, urban suburban voters, he needs to slow down on everything that happens all the time as the house is on fire. Like he's reaching a point where, excuse me, like the boy who cried wolf, because every single thing that happens is like, oh my God, this is the worst thing that's ever happened. Like, how many times can you come out and say, this is the worst thing ever? It's getting a bit much. Right. OK, well, a week is a long time in politics. And if we're going to have an election, uh, many of the sitting MPs will be hoping it is on October the 19th. It so won't be. That, uh, so that they can qualify for their pension, <laughs> as we mentioned earlier. Anyway, guys, thanks very much. We will thanks, chat again in the near future.